Facebook page. You got it. Thanks, Joyce. There you go. Let me just share my yeah. screen here. I don't know if I'm sharing the right one. No, PSP Compass Solutions Blue Circle. Yep, there we go. Okay. All right. Wow, nothing wants to work for me today either. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I appreciate that choice. Um, okay. Pleasure to be on here. Um, it, it sounds like there's some other uh, people that had some uh, marketing experience as well. So just to kind of give a precedence for this, me and Lance, my business partner, we've made it a business to kind of help business owners understand what marketing is, where to start, how to get moving forward. Uh, we've noticed that there was a lot of ambiguity within the marketing industry and the landscape. So that's the whole reason we, even with the logo and then even our company name, PSP Compass, it stands for people, service, profit. And our whole motto is if you focus on people, provide a quality service, profits guaranteed to follow. You don't have to focus on it. It comes from an uh, ideology that I learned in my corporate days when I worked for FedEx, where stop looking at how much you stop looking at how much you'd have to pay or how much you're going to make and focus on the group of people you're going to do it with you tend to make a profit when you have the right type of people around you and you have the right type of knowledge. So that's kind of a little bit about us. Um, PSP Compass, um, we basically market and tell everybody where your outsourced marketing dream team and where we kind of cover is consulting primarily for education, implementation of any and all services that you guys, that people need, and then analysis. That would be the last part. So um, as I said, our approach is that people first, you know, top-notch services and then lasting success. Um, how we do that is by tailor, custom tailored marketing strategies. We primarily focused on small businesses where trans, we had transitioned into medium businesses a couple of years in. So some of the topics and what I'm about to go over was our experience with small to medium businesses and the pricing and everything that all has to do based on that demographic and those type of clients we worked with bigger companies when you start getting into the larger companies uh, more complex campaigns and marketing campaigns that's where the pricing gets a little bit different but without further ado um, our idea was how do you maximize growth with low cost and high ROI so part of what we did with that is we have uh, we have a three-tier system that we go after three different marketing channels that we primarily um, advise all clients to go after. And this is based off our experience and all the campaigns that we've done, trying everything and almost anything under the bridge and over the bridge to see what works. The first thing is local SEO. And for Jonathan, I know you've been to some of my other presentations. This might be some repeated uh, information, but I added a little bit to it with this presentation. So what is local SEO? Local SEO is local search engine optimization for presence and local visibility. And what this does is this allows clients to be easily found in the local area, regardless of the device they use. So primary three devices, as everyone knows, your mobile device, your tablet, and your desktop. As of right now, mobile devices are used about 80 to 90% of the time when looking for any type of service or business on Google, Bing, or Yahoo, anything like that. Tablets come in, uh, I think, I believe it was uh, second and then desktops third, but depending on the service or the product that you have, the it's going to be mobile first, then desktop and then tablets. So then that comes off of Google Analytics when we measure different uh, clients. The other thing is uh, how much local SEO costs. So this is the big thing that a lot of people don't know where to start, how much, what you should be putting towards it and what's the measurables on it. What we say with local SEO, it should cost no less than $400 per month and no more typically around $600 per month. Just because local SEO is a long-term type of investment, it, you know, that goes into, you know, when you should see results. But basically because of that, we've noticed that anything less than 400, they're probably not doing enough work. Anything more than 600, you're getting the same amount of work and you only could do so much every month to make an impact and to get different results. Um, in terms of how much should you, uh, wait, I already put that, how much it costs. Sorry, my screen is going back and forth here and I am trying to work that out while I'm talking. 
There we go. When you should see results. Typically, 60 to 90 days is when you should see the results. And what you measure with local SEO is increased clicks, calls, and directions requests. And this is just general traffic to your website and to your business's brand and presence online. And that can that's primarily your website traffic, but that include that can include your social media, what you're posting on there, if you're consistent, any press releases, blogs, anything that you put out there. Um, as I said before, I had a disclaimer on here. These estimates are intended for startups, small companies, medium companies making under uh, a mil revenue per year. Once you get over that, these prices tend to change just because you have more personnel and you're doing more channels and strategies at the same time. Um, the next channel that we focus on, come on, is paid advertising. So paid advertising is any type of advertising that requires any type of payment. Now, I distinctly tell people, everybody asks me, is boosting post paid advertising? Technically, it is because you're paying for it, but it's not considered paid advertising or PPC in regards to what marketing companies or any of us that have dealt with it. It doesn't really do anything for you. It's part of organic advertising. You just pay to boost your posts and get it in front of more audiences. That's all it does. It doesn't track conversions. It doesn't track anything else. It just tracks how many people, how many more people saw that post versus organically just posting it. So what paid advertising should cost? Now, this is this can vary a lot depending how many campaigns you're running, how well your product and service does. What we have gathered is. Oh, I guess I forgot to put it on there. I apologize. It's your ad management fee should be anywhere between $500 per month, and it can go up to $2,000 per month, depending how many campaigns you're running. Um, and ad spend. I messed this up. I apologize, guys. So your ad spend budget is in addition to your management fees. Typically for ad spend budget for testing phase, we, we recommend about $350 per month. On average, when you start getting out of the testing phase, our minimum is $500 per month for ad spend plus your management fees. And that, that's the one that's anywhere between $500 to $2,000 per month. So a lot of people don't understand that your ad spend is usually not included with management fees for marketing companies, but that's something that you want to consider when hiring a marketing company and add into it. And you talk about that with your company based on your goals, your strategy. If you're a new company versus an existing company that has run ads, your ad spend recommendations can vary from there. When you should see results with this one, it's 60 to 90 days as well. But what you measure with this is, of course, your web traffic, how many people are clicking into the ad, into your website, your conversions, which is set up at the beginning of your campaign. So conversions are anything that somebody clicks into your ad, and that's if you want to submit a form, you want to submit a contact list, if you want them to go to your product and finish out a transaction on an e-commerce website, that's what you want to measure, as well as ad engagement. That is one of the things we measure at the end, that if your ad's not doing well with engagement, people are looking through it. Um, they're not directed to your landing page. You're not staying on there long enough. You probably want to revisit the content on there and adjust and tweak things as necessary. With paid advertising, though, just as a reference, usually when you start out a campaign, you're making three to five or three to 10 different types of ads to see what works well and to see which one gets the most engagements, the most clicks, the most um, uh, conversions on it at first. And then you start narrowing down which ones work and which ones don't. The last and third channel that we focus on is email marketing. Email marketing in, is any type of promotional and informational message that you're directly sending to your audience via email. Now, oddly enough, email marketing is one of the oldest and most effective marketing strategies that has been around for about several decades. Started out with a big tech boom and it's still being used, but I'm sure you guys have all seen the annoying emails that you get in your inbox every day that you have to click through. So being very targeted and very careful with the content you put on there is something that we recommend for clients. I always say, make it short and sweet. Don't put, a, don't put any information that really doesn't matter. You can always have the, your audience go through a funnel from your newsletter or any type of emails you sent just to capture them in. Um, in a highly competitive market, it's about 
how can you stick out versus everyone else? What email marketing should cost? So the first thing I put on there, it varies. Typically, it's $75 to $1,500 per month. Now, why the big gap? Because it depends on the scope and complexity of the campaign. So with $75 a month, that's the client or the business owner doing a lot of the work on their own. So coming up with the promotional item, um, coming up with the content that they want to put in there. If it's a very simple email marketing campaign where any e you capture people's emails, uh, an email goes out once a month, maybe twice a month with some basic information in there, that's where the cost can be lower. If you get into more complex campaigns such as you send this email out, you want them to follow a funnel because you have clickable items in that email, submit a form or sign up for an event. If the company is going to be generating that content for you, that's where you're going to pay for their staff and their copywriters and social media managers to come up with a way to uh, guide this audience to that funnel. And that's all based on your goals, what you want them to do, where you're at with the company. You know, is it brand? Is it presence? Is it exposure? Or is it conversions, checkouts, retargeting? All that kind of stuff comes in the mix. And that's something you talk about with them at the beginning of the campaign to set those goals. Um, let's see here. Oh, I'm going a little too fast. The last part of this is when you should see results. So email marketing might be the most effective and been around for years, but it also takes the longest in our experience to see results. I have on here six months to 12 months and that I put on there highly depends on the email database. So for instance, with Google ads can use your email database to create more targeted ads but the minimum number of people you need in that database is about 2000. So the higher email database, the better your email marketing does. So the lower it is, you're also paying for that brand exposure. You want to create a larger email database to be able to make it more effective. Um, it takes 72 hours for a campaign to be complete. This is something we tell all clients on average, when you start an email campaign, you send out your first email, you give it about 72 hours for everybody that's going to click into that email, look at that content to be able to see it after 72 hours. It, you might have some trickle effect after the fact, but within those first three days is where you're going to see the most click ins of your emails, the most conversions or anything that you want them to do, whatever the goal was at first. Um, Best case scenario, within 24 hours, you can see some results from that campaign. So those three channels are what we focus on and kind of what we've seen the best effect with. What I'm about to show you is the average increase in business we've seen within six months. And this data was compiled on average on an ROI investment generated by various combinations. So these are just the three combinations that we've used. With local SEO, if you just do that, you have a five to one ROI. Now, for anybody that doesn't know exactly what an ROI is, that five to one is for every dollar you spend on marketing, you want to see $5 in return. Now, you want to take into effect how long it takes for any of these channels or all three of these channels, whether you do one, two, or all three, how long it takes for those to start getting results. And then you want to look at this ROI. With local SEO, Google ads, it's seven to one. And of course, if you do all three with email marketing, it's 10 to one. The one note about email marketing, because it takes so long to see results in our, you know, in our experience, you always want to tie email marketing to an, some other type of marketing channel that you're doing. Uh, primarily, if you're only going to do two, I would do Google ads and email marketing because Google ads has the paid portion of what you're doing. So you're generating that traffic, you're grabbing people off search results, and then the email marketing nurtures them for your company and your updates and what exactly you want and basically makes them follow through that funnel and what you want them to do. Keeping them engaged and that consistent uh, content that you're pushing out is very important when you're doing marketing. Um, for instance, with uh, we talk about with organic social media, it's better for you to post one time a week than to have six posts post once a month in one week. Just because that consistent engagement, it works for the algorithms and SEO on the back end, but it also works to keep your brand and your company top of mind for the target audience and what you're going after with them. So um, that's basically the uh, ROI investment and kind of what we look at. The other, what I usually mention is other uh, marketing service that we that you can look at that you'll hear about is organic SEO. The only difference between organic SEO and local SEO is local SEO is constricted to your local area within a 
I'd say a five to 15 mile radius of where your company is physically present. Organic SEO is good for e-commerce stores where you can sell your product across the United States and your audience is, is uh, spread across all these different areas. It's more expensive and it's a little more time consuming just because you're going outside of your local area, but sometimes that's probably the right fit depending where you're at with your company. Um, for startups or for anybody that hasn't done a lot of marketing or done it on their own and they want to create a consistent way, they brought in a marketing company or a consultant, I always say to start with local SEO, build your local presence up. Once you start getting good traction on that, then you can expand into more national, more S general SEO type of uh, channels and campaigns just because it's more cost effective that way. Um, some other ones are native ads. Now, where are my notes? Oh, native ads. So for you, those, those of you who don't native ads, native ads match the look and feel of your site and app to provide a better user experience for your visitors. So if anybody's gone to a website and seen these ads that are embedded, it looks like they're embedded in the website or it looks like it's part of the website. Those are native ads. Those can be effective, but from a consumer end, I know from personal experience, they're highly annoying because I don't know what's part of the website and what's not. I always get it when I use those free conversion links of converting a JPEG to a PNG or something like that. So that is one channel that you can use. Um, organic social media marketing. Of course, everyone knows that. Organic is just using social media posts, content, videos, podcasts, uh, reels. Reels and videos are the highlight, are the most highest form of conversions for social media, that all counts as organic uh, social media advertising. The next thing is content marketing. Um, there was, I believe, Nate, you did content marketing, so you can correct this definition from what I had, but this is a marketing strategy used to attract, engage, and retain an audience by creating and sharing relevant articles, videos, podcasts, and other media. Um, how I use content marketing is I'm very... I'm very active on LinkedIn. So I post a lot of content on there regarding marketing, some tips, tricks, things that I believe that I feel that business owners, it would be good to know and understand um, anything that has to do related to marketing that could be applied to their business. What Joyce does with LinkedIn and being able to utilize it the best you can, that can be considered content marketing. You're not paying for it, but you're not directly targeting an audience. You're just targeting an audience that follows you and then inviting more uh, people to become followers of you. And then SMS marketing, of course, uh, that's all those text messages you get that you end up blocking after reading it for about five seconds that you don't need. That could be effective if you know how to use it and you put the right content, the right copy in there. You don't want to bombard it. Um, a company that's really good at it that I just, they don't know how to convert very well are the loan sharks. So I get texts from them um, almost every day. And they make these long texts that you have to scroll down. You want to make them short and sweet with those. And then app-based marketing. So app-based marketing could be organic or it could be paid. For instance, uh, dating apps. Dating apps are owned by conglomerates. You pay to get into three or four of those apps that they own. And then you have advertisement within those apps. Next door is another one that could be organic. You sign up to create a business account on there. And then you can post content on there that people can go to if they see your business or they are more interested in the content that they see. So a little bit about our process. So what we, our process, what we do is we do a lot, our, we start with a lot of one-on-ones and here we help people, we help the business owner define what their objectives are. We help set clear goals to be able to measure success. And some of those goals, what you want to consider is increasing web traffic, generating more leads, or improving brand awareness. With each one of those goals or all those goals, you know, you want to custom tailor a campaign to it. So brand awareness could have a different type of strategy and campaign to increasing website conversions. So it all depends what you want to do. We figure that out in the one-on-one -on -one process. The recommendation process, this is where we talk about the marketing channels you should use. We discuss a plan for your content strategy and addressing your audience. And then we figure out how to showcase your company's expertise. We discuss budget and then implementation of how to execute this plan that we went over. Um, with that recommendation process, how we operate is we give them all the tools and we advise them on what they should do. And 
they can decide if they want a company to do it for them or if they want a hybrid where they do some of it themselves or they have an agency or company come in and help them out do everything that they don't have the time to do. The last part of this is the accountability. This is what I tell everybody is the most important part. This is where we help identify how, the, how effective the marketing strategy is, usually after those result times kind of go over for each one of those channels. So usually within 60 to 90 days, we go over how well these marketing strategies are doing. We look at the data. Um, with that said, a lot of this data comes from free resources like Google Analytics, Google Search Console. Um, SEMrush has data that they you could type in your URL on there and you could see how well your keywords are doing. All that kind of stuff is what we use to measure this data. And then they also have paid software that we use to give you a little bit more detail. Um, with, that an, with that accountability process, this is where after we look at the data, it's refining the process, tweaking it. It's not a one size fits all, all the time. And usually some of the stuff you do at first doesn't always work. So this is where you want to really think in, you want to really be creative, think outside the box and think, okay, if this is not working, what else can we do? Uh, what, what can we tweak? What can we change to be more targeted, more defined? And I believe that was it for my presentation. So I wanted if Joyce, if we had time, I wanted to open it up to any questions or if anybody had any type of comments, feedback or anything like that. Yes, you bet. So James, how about we uh, I'll stop your sharing? Is that okay? Sure, yeah. Let's Please go do. back to the whole group here, back to my gallery. Yeah, so people could simply, um, I see An Anaya has, a, she's raised her hand. Do you wanna ask a question, Anaya? And also while you're doing that, do a quick introduction. We've had a couple of people come in later. So if you came in, I don't know, maybe after James started, then please, um, Okay, and Carlos has got his hand up. So Anaya, you go first. You're the first one I saw. Can you unmute, please, Anaya, to ask your question? Are you able? I mean, are you able to use your microphone? Or if maybe not, type it in the chat box. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. You can type your question into the chat box for James to answer if you have a question. And also type your info in there too, because we didn't get a chance to hear from you earlier. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm just going to move over to Carlos, who's got his hand up. Yeah. Go for the Carlos. Um, so James, obviously, I live in the mobile world, and a lot of stuff has changed recently with spam and texting and registration with the FCC. Do you guys have any sort of automations that you're setting up for clients that you need to worry about with marketing? I know we have to worry about with text messaging, but is there anything that compliance wise that you have to worry about? Yeah, the one thing that we've been dealing with, uh, with Google switching from their Google Analytics three to four, and for everybody that's not familiar with that, Google switched their data platforms that measures your website data. This is a free platform. So whoever doesn't have it, I'd highly recommend looking into it. It basically measures all your visiting data and website data and traffic on Google Analytics. When they switched that over to four, the whole reason this was being switched is because of privacy laws getting more strict. So first party data versus third party data. First party data is anybody that submits their phone number, email, any type of personal information on that. They want to see it, that they're submitting it into a platform that the company owns. That, that means they had to go out of their way or they had to make an intentional decision to say, hey, I love uh, Carlos Mobile Office Strategy. So, hey, send me some texts, send me some emails. Here's all my information versus getting their email from a third party platform like Nextdoor or someone else oh. where they made their email available and you grabbed it and put it onto there. That's getting more strict. And that's where they're adding all these different types of policies, procedures that we have to do. Now, in terms of the automation, a lot of these platforms or software that we use, they have that, uh, they have adapted for that type of policy and that procedure to make sure that they're asking people, hey, are you sure you want to sign up for this newsletter? Are you sure you want to mm -hmm. submit this form with this info to get them to contact you? It's all these different types of steps and stuff that we're taking. Now, with that said, there's still some companies and some platforms out there that are not doing that. So on our end as a company, 
whenever we do ads, we have to make sure that we own all the types of platforms and channels. And by a main own that we set it up, we put in all the parameters to be able to gather this information. The biggest thing that we deal with, we do uh, clients overseas. So every time we do somebody do something with somebody in Europe, Germany, Italy, uh, Julia can attest to that. She helped us with one client over there. We have to follow other guidelines called GDPR, and they're way more strict than the U.S. is. Um, I was just reading about some companies that paid these multi-million dollar fines because, oh, ChatGPT. ChatGPT got shut off there because they were taking people's information from when they sign up, and then they were using it for other type of companies and software that they had, but they weren't selling it to people. That violated GDPR laws. So they got a big fine and they had to shut down for a little bit till they, re, uh, I guess, fixed the problem of what they were doing. I don't know exactly what they were doing, but yes, sorry, long-winded answer, but no, that's I, a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of what I figured you'd say, because I have to deal with that on the SMS and text stuff. But I think people fail to realize that all the digital marketing that people do, unless you're getting permission from the end users, you're in trouble. I mean, yeah. I see it every day and I get emails from people just randomly text, texting or emailing me. And if there's no stop or unsubscribe, I hate to say it, but I block you, which and mm -hmm. say that you're spam. And suddenly now your email becomes unusable because you're now on a spam list. You know? Yep. And uh, these email marketing platforms that they use, if you use a main one, like don't build your own. I know with Clavio, MailChimp, uh, some of the two that I've used they have automatic unsubscribe button. So if you ever get an email and you go down to on the email, you'll see the label of which platform generated that email. And it's usually MailChimp, Clavio, or I forgot the other one. It was uh, constant contact. Worry. Constant Worry. contact, yeah. yeah. If you hit unsubscribe there, that system automatically puts your email to not be sent a newsletter when the company goes in and says, all right, here's my newsletter, send it to everybody that's active on that list. But I've even found with clients where they don't keep good, they don't keep the, the management of their email database hasn't been kept up for years. So the first time you put that database in, you get like 30 emails of people. Why are you sending this to me? Uh, I'm going to block you. I'm going to report you. And we're like, you have to, that's where I suggest sending them an email back, taking the time that first time and just be like, Hey, we're so sorry. Uh, we'll take you off of our list because you still want to keep them out there if they're interested in your company, but also you don't want to leave them with a bad taste. Like it was robotic where you just put them on your list and you never answer if they don't want to be on it anymore. But usually these systems, they will automatically take them off if they hit that unsubscribe button, but it's always in small print on the bottom of the email because they try to encourage people not unsubscribing, which means their only other option is block you or report you as spam. So Jonathan has a question. Go for it, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a, a dovetailing into all of that since, you know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the visual creator guy. Yeah. Um, People are, because uh, you were talking about uh, getting in trouble with the authorities and such because you're not exactly following the rules because you may not know the rules. You need to know the rules. That's why you have someone like James who knows the rules. Uh, I had an interesting situation a couple of days ago where I went to an event um, and found out that the event wasn't really what they said it was. It was a photo shoot and they had everybody there to be models for the event organizer, yada, yada, because we tried to do this before, but we didn't really get it. So everybody just kind of act nice and we're going to put forth for the camera like, oh, OK, so nobody had model releases. There was no legalities mm -hmm. for this. They were going to be putting it on their social feed, blah, blah, blah. And um, you know, all you need is one halfway litigious person to put you in a ringer because false uh, uh, premises of being there, uh, using their likeness uh, to promote a business without their uh, express written consent, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I am producing uh, content for anybody, I have to have the legal paperwork done for that. And they had about 35 people who didn't realize that what they were doing was actually being unpaid professional models to promote a, uh, a business and service. Well, it's going to, it's just going to be on social media, but it's still promoting a business 
or service. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that can get them in a whole lot of trouble, much like, well, it's just an email. What's the problem? Right? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that, James? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a big thing. That's where something I don't, I don't know exactly within the video field or the, um, that field, if, uh, how that works, but because that's becoming something, it's more apparent and more on the top of people's mind. It's one of those things you want to be proactive about versus reactive. So that's why with us, like right now, for instance, with something like that, we have, like I was talking about, we have a database that we'll grab from somebody's booking software, from a client's booking software of all their clients. Technically, they said that they could use the they could use that information for marketing from that business. But if we put it into an email chain or an email marketing chain, that's not technically what they said they could do with it. It was more in the booking software for any type of info. So that's where I always I tell the client, I'm like, hey, I would, you know, I'd recommend sending a mass email and just saying, hey, you know. We'd love to put you guys on our newsletter since you're already getting emails from the booking thing, just to be proactive about it. Because, you know, if it may not be against policy or against regulation to not do to to do that, but like as Jonathan was saying, you know, it may leave a bad taste, and you may not even want to have people, you know, feel a little uneasy of like, hey, why'd you guys do that? Because I've noticed even with my uh, my dad. By the way, Joyce, I got to introduce you to him because he needs help. My dad <laughs> signing up and, you know, looking for new jobs like Lockheed and everything. He doesn't he's realizing how many different systems you got to use to do background checks and do all this stuff and put in your info. And he's just like, when did it come to that? <laughs> like what happened to going in person and trusting the person I know I was giving this info to? And mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it's a big thing nowadays that where I, I would recommend definitely saying, hey, you know, this is what we're going to do with it. Here's what we'd like to put you guys on. If anybody has any objections, please email us back and we'll exclude you from the list. 80% of the time, most people are going to be like, they're not going to even reply back to you, which means, okay, cool. We'll put them on there. But it accounts for that 20% of people that are going to be like, no, I don't, I don't want any more of this. I want to be consulted before this is even used for something that I already agreed to type thing. So it's right. all about business practice when it comes to that, in my opinion. Well, Carlos has another question. Or would you um, go ahead? Jonathan, you br- bring up a great point. Um, I do have a lot of my clients when I first start working with them, especially with project management software solutions and CRMs, where they're using pictures that they take at the client's homes or businesses for their social media. And I've had them change their contracts that, add, I mean, I have it added in mind for my other company that any photos that I take uh, at the event or whatever, you know, will be used. Well, I mean, I just straight up say it will be used for social media purposes and marketing purposes. And, you know, I did have one client that came at me and says, Hey, you can't take a picture. And I'm like, yes, signed off. Yeah, you did. You know, if you, if you want me to turn around and walk off the site, that's fine. But that's part of my deal to be able to market my own company and you no names are used or anything like that. But I think a lot of companies are using those pictures that they take on a daily basis of the business business, whatever they do with a client and marketing with that and forgetting that they've got nothing to, to really uh, kind of uh, protect themselves if, if that person does want to go back at them. So good point, Jonathan. I mean, get a lawyer involved. Trust me, those contracts need to be ironclad. <laughs> well, it's, it's just the whole thing of if you hire a professional, you tend to get things done right no matter what it is, whether it's your marketing or, or the person who's going to uh, to work on your car. And most people don't know what they don't know until it's too late and then the lawyers and the judges are involved. So, um, you know, wh- we've, we've gotten so used to things like social media, we forget that it's there's personal social media and there's business social, social media. Mm. Um, one is promoting you as a person, that's promoting you as a business and the judge is gonna see it very differently. So again, poke, poke, hire a guy like James who knows the difference. Perfect. Okay, we've got time for another question or two. And thanks for finishing up a little early, James, so that we can get all these great questions in. And by the way, Anaya, did you see how James did put his PDF of his slides into the chat? Also, what I'm going to do, although I may be a little bit complicated till I get 
full access to my email and such. But my my practice is after each of these monthly meetup groups, I will take um, the slides and the link to the YouTube. So this Zoom recording converts over to a YouTube video on a playlist I have strictly for Simplifier social media. So then I typically email all that, but I might just go through meetup this time because of these tech issues I'm having. But one way or another, I'll get this information to you, the, the recording and the um, and also the slides. But any of you can download that document from James. OK, so back to the questions. Okay. Well, one of the things that, um, you know, am I there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, well, you know, and a lot of this discussion is, uh, you know, huge. Man, James, um, thanks for coming on here. Uh, you know, I, it's really great to see uh, see people that are local that we can actually communicate with one on one. We're not sending people to some dude in Chicago in Mama's basement. You know, it's great. I really, I think it's awesome. But um, one of the things uh, being in real estate, where we have the conundrum of you know, the photo issue of, you know, do we have these releases? It's the one of the most litigious um, industries out there. And it's also even more hated than marketers, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we're, we're always walking that fine line. Uh, we're seeing, you know, people get, uh, you know, the just listed or the just sold. And I can't tell you how many in this industry in real estate with real estate agents, for instance, you post just sold and you show these people's old house. And then the very next week, somebody posts that same real estate agent will post the brand new truck they bought with that commission they just earned. And it makes people feel horrible. And so what I would say with all social media is, you know, you look at it like when we talk with our daughters or our children, would grandma appreciate you posting that online? If the answer is no, don't post it. If your friends are going to be upset for any reason, the answer is probably not a good idea to post it. Um, and it's just one of those things, just be nice. Um, and sounds like uh, you've really got it under control there, James. And by the way, hey, Carlos, is that a competitor, Capone Digital Marketing to James? To, to Nate's kind of joke about how you don't want the Chicago kid in the yeah. basement. <laughs> I don't know. I just was like, why are you putting that chat in about another digital marketing company? No, that was a fake one. You know, Capone Industries, you know. Okay. All right. I'm very literal, very literal. So I'm like, what? Well, okay. on, that, on that note, Joyce, uh, yeah. that's the whole reason we started the company. And Nate, I really appreciate it. It, it was to have that in-person face-to-face. I actually, I uh, took our social media manager, Julia. We went to one of our clients and that was the first thing they said is usually with digital marketing companies, you're talking to someone over a video out in Timbuktu and you don't have that per, the personableness to it to, under, to understand that. Mm -hmm. Hey, they understand where we're trying to go and they're explaining like, here's how to get there. Here are the challenges in getting there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, one of those things, uh, Carlos. Yeah, a lot of digital marketing agencies. The biggest thing they like to do is hold your website hostage when uh, you mm -hmm. stop using them as a service. And that was one of the things that me and my business partner were like, nope, they want to go somewhere else. We'll go out of our way to make sure their team has all the info, especially analytics. Every time we've always uh, received a client from uh, another marketing agency, they don't give us the previous analytics that they spent, I don't know, six months, year, two years what? compiling. Yeah, because oh. you could always create different accounts in Google Analytics, Google Ads. But that data, and I'll tell everybody here, your data is worth more than your company. I promise you that at some points. Now, don't take that literally, Joyce. Uh, sometimes it doesn't always work out like that. No, but, but that's a good point. As a general yeah. rule, your data is worth more than your company. It's what the it's what Facebook and yeah. Google is, is, is in the business of. That's why Google and Facebook offer these type of platforms and these services to us as consumers for free because our data is worth more than what we're using on their service. So that applies to anybody with a business. As you get bigger, that data allows you to make better decisions, more effective marketing decisions, and even um, transitioning into some other different product or service. That data allows you to do that in a way better way with all these um, 
without the opposition of trying to figure out, okay, what's going to work, what's not mm -hmm. going to work. So keeping track of your data, keeping ownership of your data on these platforms mm -hmm. is the most important thing. And that's what we set up business owners to do. So well, if they I didn't do it that. before us, they get access to it. We tell them how to add people to it and how to take people off when they're not uh, behaving correctly. So they keep track of their data and they keep ownership of it. I think that's a perfect note to end on. Absolutely perfect. And by the way, James' LinkedIn posts are amazing. So if you're not connected with him on LinkedIn, do that and track with him. Go look up his posts like once a week, twice a month, whatever, because you will learn so much and share them too. The other thing I want to say is we're wrapping up and I'm going to put it into the chat. Now, I didn't want to interfere with your program there. Whoopsie, I'm going to have it. Um, next month, our speaker is like Marie Leslie and maybe, and Lloyd Dubois, I think you're my longest people I've known, Michelle too, it kind of falls in that category. It's Beth Klepper of Mainstream Video Productions. And she is absolutely amazing. Um, she is, she just helps me so much in every possible way. Now I mainly work with her, uh, her videographer, um, uh, Erica Jaffe. Like on these six videos I recently created and the three about what she's going to talk about. I did six on FAQ. So go to my YouTube channel and check those out. Um, but I'm going to see if I can get this here. But next month, September 12th, we have Beth coming to do three videos to tell us about how three videos to save time and make money. I, and I highly, highly recommend you come. Here is the link. Okay. Now you can go right in, save it in the chat, resave your chat. I didn't want to do that too soon. And uh, she's a great presenter, a lot of fun. And she really helped me a lot with kind of conceptualizing my videos. And then I wrote the script for them and worked directly with my videographer. And what she's really referring to, many of you may know about this, are the ethos, those videos that show you are the real deal, shows your professionalism. The pathos videos like, oh, don't you hate it when you go to LinkedIn and you don't know what you're doing and it's so overwhelming. Oh, you could really want someone to help you. I mean, not quite that dramatic, but it's along those lines. Or the logos. Okay, now you've signed up with Joyce. What's it going to be like to work with her side by side on Zoom, in person? Oh, we have a group here. There's another video on how I work with groups. So they're not quite up on my website yet, but the, uh, well, they're all on my YouTube channel. So if you just go to Bloomer Social Media Tutor, please subscribe. And I usually include that in my verbiage I send out afterwards. So I want to get sort of like sneak previews, coming attractions, whatever. I'm going to see Barbie. Hopefully this weekend. I was supposed to go on Sunday, but I was sick. And I can hardly wait. <laughs> it's broken all kinds of records. And I think it's pretty awesome. I'm not going to Oppenheimer. Um, too long, too many hours in the day. But Barbie should be a hell of a lot of fun. Um, so any final words here as we wrap up together? Thanks again. Big round of applause for James. Holy cow. That was just so, so, so good. I got to stop the recording before I forget. Um, but here we go. Stop. The, yeah, stop the recording.